All right, what's up, everybody? Welcome to YA. We're so excited that you're here. Uh, just excited to, to go into a time of worship. So would you guys please stand? I'm just going to pray real quick. Lord, thank you so much just for this time where we can honor you and we can praise you, Lord. Let your presence just be in this place already and let it fill us up, Jesus. Uh, we're so excited to just worship you and praise you this morning, uh, not this morning, tonight. Lord, we thank you. In your name we pray. Amen.
Nothing compares to your embrace, light of the world forever Thank you for this time. As just we continue to worship Jesus, I just pray you'll keep pressing into us. That your spirit can just be overflowing in our hearts. Lord, we need you.
from the mountains Jesus in the streets Jesus in the darkness over every enemy Jesus for my family I speak the holy name Jesus we sing Jesus we shout Jesus from the mountains Jesus in
Let's lift up our voices. Shout praises to him. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Lord, we're so thankful. Again, just for this time of worship where we can praise you, we can lift you up. Lord, I just pray as we go into this time of teaching where we can um, just be more uh, attentive to your word, Jesus, that you'll be in our hearts and our minds. Lord, open us up to hear your voice tonight. In your name we pray, amen. Mike check. Oh, that's crazy. Hey guys, how you doing? I usually like to I usually like to stand on the floor. I don't like being up here, but I just felt like I would you guys are just right there. I just didn't want to be right on uh, right on top of you. Uh, you guys are doing good? Everyone's I can't see everyone. Uh, the lights are a little a little up or a little down, whatever you want to say. Uh, my name is Dylan. Welcome to uh, Atmosphere Young Adults. We are really, really excited that you're here. Um, excited to see you guys again. Uh, if this is if you're here all the time, um, and if this is your first time, really, really excited to see you as well. Um, hopefully you got to meet someone, get to know someone. Um, that is, uh, I say this each week, but the heart of our group is that we do life together, that we really would do life together um, as community is supposed to. Um, I think so often we are attending church services, we're doing all sorts of things, but to like really get down into the nitty gritty of daily life with people and leaning on people. That is our prayer and our heart for this group, and that is what I'm constantly, and our leaders are constantly praying that we would continue to become. Um, I do have a couple announcements of, of announcements before we get into it. Uh, the, actually, I'm just going to kind of skip through all the announcements just to say one thing. Uh, for the Men's Connect Night, for Atmosphere Church, we are doing a Men's Connect Night, and all young adult guys, I think the ladies might be full. It might not be, so if you're a lady, this applies to you too, and I'll let them sort it out, but... Uh, the Connect Night is a church-wide thing. Uh, they really want it to be, I mean, it's like all ages. So for us, I've, I've loved going and, and I will purposely sit at a table with guys that are uh, older than me to just get to hear like guys that have been walking with Jesus for a lot longer talk about their faith. So please go to this uh, if, if you are available. It's on Monday the 29th, <laughs> boom, right there on the screen. Um, and guy, uh, young adults, we go for free. They're, the registration's paid. So it's typically 20-something dollars. So if you want to go to that number right there, uh, don't text connect. Literally just be like, I'm in young adults and I want to go to the connect night. So I really go there like they want us to be there um, and then they're making it free for us. So I, that's the only real announcement that I'm uh, going to do and I'm just going to uh, get rolling. So uh, tonight we are in week three of a, a series of a conversation that we're having around four different components of our identity as followers of Jesus, of what our culture is, of what our way of life should be, of what our life should look like, who, just who we are, what is our identity as followers of Jesus. So we talked about that we are created to love, uh, and that love and biblical love as defined by Scripture and defined by the teachings of Jesus is the only standard, uh, is the true standard as we, that we can hold it up to as we try and see how we are doing in our spiritual growth and spiritual maturity. Uh, then last week we talked about that we are created to serve uh, and that, the, that, that we are all called to be great, every single one of us, uh, but the greatness defined by the kingdom of God, the greatness in scripture is flipped on its head. It's whoever is the servant of all. It's whoever is putting themselves at the lowest position that others might be lifted up. And we wrestled with that last week. So tonight the conversation is about how we are created to worship uh, and we we have a really weird view, I think a lot of times, um, even if we have a true view, our, our view can get skewed of what worship, uh, what worship is, what it means, uh, and it's even debated upon. I'll see like videos on, I mean, some of you guys that are on, you know, you see your Instagram reels, like a video of people worshiping, and like you just know the comments are going to be bad. Instagram comments are the worst. Okay, first of all, I spend way too much time, I don't comment, very rarely will I actually comment on something, but I, I like, my favorite pastime is reading Instagram comments. I might have to give that up. They're getting worse and worse. Um, but anyway, that, that's just a tangent that you'll see people saying the craziest things about worship specifically. I mean, it's heavily debated upon. I had, talking about a weird perspective of worship, just to expose myself for a minute. Um, I, when I was going through middle school and high school, I told many of you guys just kind of the, my testimony and how uh, I had, you know, I had come to know Jesus in middle school, but through 
middle school through high school was just still loved being in that, well, didn't love it, but found myself in the middle ground between, you know, a life all in after Jesus and this, you know, the world and the pull that it had on me. But I would go to uh, summer camps every once in a while when, it, when my football schedule would allow for it, or maybe a winter camp. Um, and I would sit in worship sessions, and I would be like, God, <laughs> it's so embarrassing. I'd be like, God, if you really, if I, if like you really want me to like go into a, a, a place of worship right now, um, make the band play Oceans by Hillsong United. Otherwise, it's not happening. Like that's the only song that's going to get me. Um, and fun fact that they never played it. Like I, I missed, I just missed the window, I think, when that I got over. Like literally no one plays that song anymore. I guess it like it got played so much that it's just done. Um, so maybe I'll talk to Michael about playing that one. I'll really worship. But anyway, <laughs> the point of what I'm saying, that was like my perspective of worship. It was like it, if the song hit just right, if my emotions were just in the right place, then in that time I will allow myself to really worship, to really put myself, my heart posture in a position to worship. Uh, that was my perspective. And I, and I just share that to say that I think we, we've skewed it. And even sometimes that, that kind of bubbles back up in us where worship is dependent on all these other things. So... Tonight, I think it'd be beneficial for us to uh, kind of break it down to what worship really is. Um, and as I've been studying over the past week for this conversation, even before that, and studying through our passage of Scripture and looking into it, um, I've been wrecked, honestly been wrecked by what the true picture of worship is that's painted for us right here in this teaching of Jesus and, and all throughout Scripture. Um, and that worship is much more beautiful and real and raw and authentic than we could have ever imagined. Um, and so I'm going to pray, and then we're going to get into it. Uh, Lord, we, we just offer tonight uh, to you. Uh, this is for you, Lord. Would you just, would, would you have your way in our hearts and our minds? Um, just highlight to us uh, whatever it is that you want to teach us by your Holy Spirit, through your word. Um, encounter us tonight, Holy Spirit. We pray that you are in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. I am going to move this water bottle back, or I would kick it for sure. I do way too much walking around for hazards like that. So, um, again, I'm going to read. I'm going to read a pretty big passage of scripture. It's like half of the. It's half of John chapter four, and it's not going to be on the screen. So you gotta you gotta have it right in front of you. So John chapter four, uh, just like last week, the little the little pieces will be there as we go, but the entire scripture up front is not going to be there. And I want to read the whole thing, this whole interaction all the way through, uh, just so that we get it in its full context, and then we will go in from there. So, John chapter four. I'll give everyone a second to just make sure you get there. Again, I will not be on the screen. I'm not messing with you. So you got to find someone around you that are willing to share if you don't have it, and that's totally cool. Um, I'll get some, give me some thumbs up again. Thumbs up when we're getting there. John chapter 4, it's going to start at verse 1. Okay, all right, we're just going to get rolling. Um, starting at verse 1. Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees, uh, Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had gone through Samaria, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw and this well is deep. Where can you get the living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and, and his livestock? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this living water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will, will become in them a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't be thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, go and call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you're right. When you say you have no husband, the fact is you have five husbands. You have had five husbands, and the man, the man you have now is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, 
I can see that you are a prophet. Our, ancestor, our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet, a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in, spirit, in the Spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that the Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. All right. You guys good? That was a lot. That's like, if you fell asleep, that's probably my fault. I probably didn't read it well enough. Um, Okay, but you've, you've probably heard the story of the woman at the well, of the Samaritan woman, of this story from John chapter 4. And if you haven't, we're talking about it today, so you are in the right place. Um, but we need some context and we need some understanding to what is going on here. Jesus has led his disciples uh, to this well outside of Samaria, um, and they've gone into town to get food. And the, some of you may know that there is a kind of a, a, a social and historical tension, and, and there's some beef going on. There's some beef between the Jews and the Samaritans. You see it kind of popping up in the text, uh, in the conversation that they have, uh, but there is, there, is a, there is something going on, and so it's, it's a really big deal for Jesus. Typically, if they were going somewhere and Samaria was like in the way, typically Jews would travel around, the, they would not go through it. Like that was just historically, that's not what they're going to do. They're going to do everything they can to avoid that area. Because like I said, there's tension, there's beef, there's whatever, there's some tea. There's something going on between the two of them. And so to understand that, there's a, there's a couple reasons for why this beef, why this is happening. The first is that Jews did not view Samaritans as true Hebrews or as true Israelites. So there, we're going to go for a quick history lesson. If you hate history, you're just going to have to bear with me. It's, it's going to be quick, but we got to understand it. So thousands of years earlier, uh, the Assyrians took over the, the, the nation of Israel, and there was a split. And so some of, the, some of the Israelites decided to stay as opposed to leaving. And what happened was they intermarried with the Assyrians. So you have Israelites intermarrying with the Assyrians that formed what's now, or in the text, is known as Samaria. The issue with that is that according to the, the Hebrew law, uh, you could not be a, a full, a true Israelite if you intermarried with a different people group. So they have become this, like a, a way that historical, uh, some, some historians, they like a half-breed is what they were called, where they're like, half, it sounds terrible, it's like, it's weird, but that's the way that they called it. It was like these... That was, there was this, this weird dynamic going on. And so the, the Israelites were just like, nope, you are not a part of us. Like, we do not associate with you. And so you could bet that when the disciples went into the town to get food, as Jesus led them to do, we don't see it here in the text, but just knowing the tension that was there, they definitely, like, felt dirty being there. They definitely looked down upon who they were with. So there's a lot, I mean, there's a lot going on here that we don't have time to unpack. This passage of Scripture I've, you can dive into it from like a thousand different angles as to what is being, what is going on and how it can speak to all sorts of things from social justice to what we're talking with worship, just all sorts of stuff that is happening here in this passage of scripture. So that is the first one, the first reason as to why there's an issue. The second has to do with like the land they're standing on itself. Not like the, the, the situation tells a story, but the land tells a story as well. So hopefully you guys are with me. If you're, if you're super bored, that's whatever, sorry. Um, so the land... At one point, here's part of it, at one point was occupied by a tribe of Israelites where the leader of that tribe, and if we could go deeper, if you want to talk to me later, we can go deeper into this. The leader of that tribe of Israel had married an Egyptian woman. And so it was already, even though they thought, you know, you're not supposed to, it already from its earliest stages, that plot of ground had been a part of just this intermarriage of a, of a mixing of people groups that were still worshiping the same God. So that's from the beginning. Uh, it was also a place that Abraham, he had crossed right through there on his journey. Like there's just also Jacob, who's, this is Jacob's well, who's a major uh, biblical character, if you're not aware, and just a, a played a huge part in the, the, the picture that God paints throughout scripture. But um, he's buried. His, his bones are right there near the well. And so there's all sorts of stuff 
uh, going on. But the main thing, that the primary reason that there's an issue, and you see the woman and Jesus having a conversation about it, if you pick that up in the text, is that when the Samaritans were removed, when they were no longer a part of the greater, um, the greater is, uh, Israel, Israelite nation, they developed their own place of worship. And that's because the, the, the Jews believed that you could only worship in Jerusalem. And that was, that is the true place of worship. Jesus says that, that that is where the temple is. That is where the true place of worship is. And so, you know, we have these Samaritans who are like, well, we can't go there. Like, we're literally not allowed. If we go there, they'll kill us. We're not allowed there. How are we supposed to worship this God? So they, they, t- they started to kind of move and change some things about the Torah, about the law, about their scriptures. They had their own priests and their own leaders uh, that kind of ma- manipulated some stuff. So they worshipped at a mountain called Mount Gerizim. So we have the Jews worshipping, I mean, from the place that Jesus and this woman are standing. They can look and they can see Jerusalem, and they can also look and see Mount Gerizim. And so you see her make the comment of, you guys worship here, we worship here. And that is the place of tension that Jesus decides to have this interaction. It's the place that Jesus decides to to paint the first true picture that he wanted to paint for us of what worship is going to look like. So hopefully with a little bit of that understanding of that historical background, you see that there's a lot, uh, there's a lot going on here. Um, so with that context in mind, we're going to get back into the text. So uh, John 4 again, 21 through 24. You guys with me? Uh, that could have been hard. I'm sorry. It's okay. Um, okay, here we go. You're still here. You're still alive. Let's do it. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. The Samaritan worship, the Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. For salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is Spirit, and His worshipers must worship in the Spirit and in truth. So like I said, Jesus steps into this place of not just the land, but the relationship of him talking to this woman who everyone knows who this woman, I mean, there's all this stuff going on. He steps right into this place of tension and debate, uh, talks to a woman, like I said, that most people would, would say he should not be talking to. I'm sure when the disciples came and saw him talking to her, there were all sorts of questions in their mind. But all of it he knew was necessary to paint a picture of what worship was going to be. So he says first that this new form of worship will be done. The first thing he says is in spirit. And there's a reality that when you, when you are born again, when you say yes to making Jesus the Lord of your life, when you, man, I want to follow you with all that I am. When you say yes to following Jesus, you receive the Holy Spirit. And your old nature, your old sin, who you were is, is according to scripture, is dead. And there's a new nature that is, that is given to you. There's a new nature with new desires, a new, a new vision, a new passion, a new things. You're, you're completely changed. The old you has passed away. And so when we worship in spirit, it's, it's we're worshiping from our hearts. We're worshiping like the Holy Spirit is, it, it is the, the Holy Spirit enters into your heart. It changes your nature. And it is from that changed nature that you are then able to worship. So worshiping, true worship comes from our hearts, it comes from our changed hearts, and it comes from a desire to put Jesus over everything. In brief, we could go into that for hours. And then he says we must worship in truth. And this means in summary that we must worship in a way that is informed and shaped by the scriptures. By the truth of who God is, we must worship with a right view of him. And I may come back to this idea later, but I just wanted to touch on this briefly that um, there is, there's a lot of stuff that we can um, obsess about in life. There's a lot of stuff that we can obsess about as Christians, um, different little things about how we like to worship, how we like to do things. Oh, there's all sorts of stuff. Um, something that I think is essential for us, if you are a follower of Jesus, and if you're not, this is something that could be huge for you, is having a right view of God. Because the reality is, if you have a, a right and high view of God, the things in your life, the little things, the issues, the struggles, the stress, they become a lot, a lot less. And you see it in a couple moments. You see it in the book of Isaiah and Ezekiel when these prophets, like, are in the presence of God. Like, there is, they are not thinking about, like, the argument they just had with their buddy a few minutes ago. Like, they are all, they are fully engrossed in that moment. And so if we can get to a place worshiping, worshiping in truth 
where we have a right view of God, it changes everything about our perspective on life. And I think that's why Jesus puts that in this, in this passage as to what worship is. So again, I'm going to restate it. Jesus chooses this place with relational and geographical tension uh, about what it means to worship. He, and he says all the things about what you, your preconceived notions about worship. And for us tonight, we're doing the same thing. You, you take them off the table. What is worship? What does it mean? How is it defined? Take them off the table. We're going to allow it to be redefined by Jesus or just open up our understanding. He says this new form of worship, it won't matter who you are or where you are or what you've done or, or who you're associated with. God will desire, all God is going to desire is your true and proper worship. And that was so foreign to them at the time, and that worship was so contingent upon where it was happening and what your name was and what tribe you came from. And, and even today, we have our own context of, of how we feel like we can worship. And man, I've, got, I've just done too much to really come before God. I've done too much to really have a strong relationship with God. I don't understand Him enough. Whatever it may be, He says, take those things off the table. The worship I am presenting to you has nothing to do with who you are or where you've been or what you've done. It's a new form of worship that that erases all of those things. And worship is no longer about location, about nationality in the context of here. It's no longer about denomination. It's no longer about political opinion or whatever it may be, or Instagram followers. Worship is about the heart. And so it really seems as though Jesus picked this messy situation physically and all these different things that we keep talking about. The messiest situation is possible with one of the messiest people that he could present it to, as we talk about this, all that this woman has been through, he picks this messy situation and this messy person uh, to, to say, this is the new form of worship and this is the kingdom of God that is coming. And I think that I'm always fascinated. We talked about it last week about the nature of the kingdom of God, that in order to be great in the kingdom, it requires you to be the lowest on the totem pole, basically, and how that flips everything on its head. I am fascinated and I love the way that Jesus constantly presents these ideas to us in a way that just doesn't make sense for how we understand the world even today. And so that's what he's doing right here. And so often we talk, we have this conversation. I've heard, I've heard a lot of different teachings or just conversations. Um, and I've kind of stopped where it's like, okay, how are we, someone's like, you know, how are we supposed to worship Jesus? It's like, okay, in spirit and in truth. Like, boom, that's it. I'm like, right, 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 right. No, but how do we, like, what, how do we worship him? It's like, well, you worship him. No, it's like, what, how do we, what is worship? Like in this, do you see what I'm saying? Like the word worship, what does that actually look like? How do I worship in truth? What is the, the worship part? I know what truth is, but what is the worship part? Is it like when Michael is up here and he sings a couple songs, is that worship? Or is it when I come into church on a Sunday and it's those couple songs up front and the songs that like those were my two touch points of worship, is that worship? So often we stop here, what is worship? So you guys with me? Okay. So in order to define this, we're going to, this when I was, when I, when I found this out, um, a couple of the guys can attest, I was like telling this, this blew my mind. So we're going to just hang with me here. This is how the Gospels specifically, and then all throughout the New Testament, this is how they define worship. So the Greek word for worship that we use, I mean, you could check this right here. The word for worship that Jesus uses in this teaching and all of his teachings on worship is a word, see if I can pronounce it right. Pros, proskuneo, okay? No, I haven't studied Greek that much, so if that's wrong, you know, sue me. Um, that's the word that's used for worship, okay? So according to, according to scholars and according to the best understanding of the Greek language and the Greek text, the best, the way that we can understand the meaning of that word, here it is, is to kiss like a dog licking his master's hand. <laughs> That's, un that's uncomfortable. That that's, the cl that's the definition that Jesus is going to use for worship? Like a dog licking? That, like, that just sounds terrible. And you know, like, I, I, I mean, I for sure, when I read that, first reaction was like, man, I'm uncomfortable. I've shown a couple people since then, and they didn't, they're like, ah, I don't know, that, that makes me, that's, that's weird. That's a, like a weird understanding, but just like hang with me. If you think about any dog lovers in the room, come on. Okay, cat lovers. Keep the hands down. So we're going to go, so dog lovers. So, so we, you know how a dog, like when a dog, just en envision you, you come home tonight and your dog is there. Like there is this level of love and adoration and just like, dogs are insane. Like they're the, like the way that they just love you and the way that like you're like, why, it just, 
you know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm trying to describe here, like this moment between the owner and the dog when they just, and it's just the best thing ever, and that's why dogs are so much, because cats, they just give you attitude. So, like, that moment, that moment between you and your dog and the moment that's being described by this word, it's, it's, it's painting a picture of biblical worship. That blew my mind. And I just continue to wrestle with that thought. That that is, and you could, if you're like, this guy's lying, just look it up. It's not, I'm not just making this up. That is the picture that's painted of biblical worship by Jesus in this passage as he lays out for us, what is it going to look like to worship me? And so we're going to read on in John 4, 23. It says, yet a time is coming and has now come when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit, in the spirit and in truth. For this, these are the kind of worshipers that the Father seeks. So there is a specific, not only is worship in itself this concept that we now kind of have to wrestle with as we realize that it's, it's deeper and more raw and real and authentic than we originally thought. But he's also saying there are a, there's a specific type of worshiper that the Father seeks. And I thought that language was, was super interesting. We see that there is a, there's, if you look not just in this story, but if you look at the God of the Bible you see, and I've been fascinated with this and putting my heart into a position that, that mirrors that of what I see in Scripture, that we see that there is a heart posture. There is a way of worship. There is a way of seeking after God that truly moves his heart. And we see it from the Old Testament to the New Testament to interactions that Jesus has on a day-to-day -day life, that there is a heart posture. There is a way of worship. There is a way of day in and day out pursuit of Jesus that moves the heart of God. And that there is a, a type of worshiper that the Father seeks. Uh, Graham Truscott says this, When God's people begin to worship him using biblical methods, the power of his presence comes among his people in an even greater measure. So the Father is seeking worshipers who will worship him in a way, and when he finds them, as he, as he pans the earth, as he looks for people that are worshiping, that have a heart that is the one that he, that he loves to move towards, the one that is painted right here by Jesus, that's like, I mean, that image of just a, a dog just licking his master's hand, like this adoration, this obsession, this all-in type of love. He, he's, he's searching the earth, and he finds it, and what he does is he moves towards you. So that posture of your heart moves the heart of God and he moves towards you and that's what and that's when those moments in those times when we experience what is the manifest presence of God and to be honest I, I don't you know the, the presence of God is something I I've had moments in my life and it's it's not it's far I wish it was far more common but it's just the reality of our walk with Jesus but I've had moments in my life and I don't know what you believe about the presence of God and about the Holy Spirit, but I've had moments in my life when I was encountered by the Holy Spirit in a way that marked me and changed me and just grabbed hold of my heart. And there were often times when I was at my lowest, at my most broken, and all I could do was seek Jesus. That was all I had. And in those moments with a heart postured in that way and of just like all I want is you, all I need is you, everything is off the table, I was met, it was like the Father moved towards me in a way that, I mean, if you come into an encounter with the presence of God, I promise you, you, you do not leave the same. It marks you and it changes you. And I think what has hurt us as a church and hurt us as followers of Jesus as it pertains to, to the, 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 the presence of God is that we slap that phrase on all sorts of things. And we're just in a, you know, in a regular church gathering and like the song sounded really good. And so it's like, well, the presence of God must have been there. Or, you know, I, you, you see what I'm saying? We hear that used over and over again, the presence of God, the presence of God. Man, I'm telling you that the presence of God is like, you, you don't want to leave when you come into a place. And so that is, man, when I'm praying for these gatherings, when I'm praying over, i just, it's like, Lord, we, would your presence be known in this place? Because if it is known, our worship, our heart of worship will be radically shifted. And in order to, I mean, oftentimes God can, his presence can, he does whatever he wants to do. But there's, there is a truth that we see right here that God is searching for a specific type of worshiper. And it is that worshiper, it was that heart that we see depicted that God moves towards, that his presence is made known to. And so if you want to, if you want to experience the presence of God and truly encounter his presence, the Bible says that he is looking for true worshipers of whom he will make himself known. But I think that uh, 
we don't often worship in this way. Uh, I, I think most, most church gatherings I've been to, most of the time in my life, I don't think I've worshipped in this way. And even now as I read this word, and you could kind of begin to gain a better understanding of worship, and it probably, I'm not going to say probably, because it may not move you to a, 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 greater place, a greater place of worship because it's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable. And we talked about this last week, I think it was last week, that comfort will be the thing that will kill your faith. That if you spend your life running towards comfort, whatever that may be, comfort in your faith, just enough Jesus, just enough of me, uh, just enough finances so I don't have to, uh, just, oh, I just, if I could get that relationship, if I could get, comfort is going to kill your faith. That we, There's a way in which we are called to live our life, and comfort is not going to be a part of it. It's uncomfortable is the place that we are moved towards for this true and proper worship, and I think that is why oftentimes we don't put ourselves in that position. Um, I also think like we see, we often, I, I've, I've been in, in, and this is, and I'm not talking about, some of you might be like, oh, he's trying to get charismatic on me. I'm not getting charismatic. I'm just, I'm talking about a heart posture of worship. And I've, and I've come in, you know, it could be someone dancing and singing and doing all, and it could be someone sitting totally still just before the Lord. So it has nothing, it's, but, but I've, I've definitely been, there's been times in my life when I've seen people that are in this place of worship, like, I mean, their heart is seeking after him. They are all in for him. This is, like, clearly their whole life. But the way, like, they're making me uncomfortable. Like, I don't, I'm not totally sure uh, if I want to be around them. I'm like, I, you know, whatever it may be. And I've heard before when, like, people are like, well, if we have gatherings where we really try and get after it for worship, like, we really, I, this is, I'm not even kidding. I've heard people say this. Like, if we really get, like, get too into the whole worship thing, then people showing up to this gathering, showing up to the church, aren't going to want to be there uh, because they're going to get weirded out. But I just want, I mean, let's just think about this for a second. If I have never been to a church, I've never been around Christians, whatever it may be, and I walk into a gathering like this, and I see people, whatever it's going to, whether it's dancing, whether it's face down on the ground, whether it's praying for each other, I mean, whatever it is, the, their heart of worship is, is really showing up in their lives. I may not leave that gathering a Christian. I may not. But I may not believe the same thing they believe. But I do know for sure that they believe it with all that they are. Because I saw it. Because their heart of worship, their desire to seek the face of Jesus was very clear by the way that they were worshiping him. And that doesn't have to be through music. We're going to get into that. But just the way that they're living, the way that they're praying, the way that they're loving. Man, I, don't, I could walk in there and be like, I don't know if I believe that, but I, I sure know that they do. Right? Or as opposed to what happens if I go into a gathering and it's just the opposite. It's like, well, why would I, why would I really consider this? It doesn't seem like the people here really even consider it themselves. Right? One of the clearest pictures of worship, this is one of my most favorite passages in all of the Bible. And you're, and you're going to be familiar with it most likely. But um, if not, I'm going to read it. It's going to be on the screen too. This is Luke 7. Uh, verses 36 through 38. So we're going to start at verse 36. It says, When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with, tear with her tears. Then she wiped them from her with, with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. So we have this scene of the disciples and the Pharisees, and I'm sure when the disciples were involved, I'm sure like it was kind of, you know, a little bit formal, like we're a little bit, Jesus was reclining because he was the chillest, but like everyone else is probably like a little bit worried, right? And, and it's like the door swings open, and here comes this woman, right, that everyone knows who she is. I mean, everyone in the town knows. It says she's a sinful, like the Pharisees were like, he doesn't know, does he realize who she, everyone knows who this woman is, she knows how she's seen, and she knows who she is. She does not care. In fact, she goes into a scene where she's already going to be looked at a certain way, but she knows where her heart is at. The, the posture of her heart is she's running to the feet of Jesus. Then she breaks her jar of perfume, which is, again, like, I'm sure it's really quiet. Now the shattering noise, like, it's just really getting awkward. And she's pouring her perfume, weeping on his feet, wiping his feet with her hair. Like, this, this, if this isn't the picture of worship, I don't know what is. And it's so uncomfortable for us to read, I think, sometimes. And I'm sure it was really uncomfortable for the people in that room. And I, and I think we read it even, though, and we're like, 
And there's times when we're like, that is so beautiful, that's so perfect. But if we like put ourselves in that situation, wh whether it's in a church service or whatever, and someone is worshiping in a way that, that kind of mimics what that, like, what that would be in our context, I don't think that we would be like, that is so cool. I think we would be like, oh, it's kind of weird, why would they do that? That is, the, that is the reality of worship, that it drives us to this place where it's like, I don't care what people say, I don't care what people think, I don't care how people know me, like this is where my heart is at and this is how I'm going to worship. That is the place that we want to get to. This is the type of worship that moves the heart of God. And we see it in, in, in other times, like I said, in, in, in Jesus' ministry as he's walking and these people full of desperation, just shouting his name, like not letting crowds deny them pushing their way to, those are the people who have their hearts set on getting to him no matter what the cost, no matter what people think, no matter what people say, those are the people to whom his heart is moved for. And so again, we slap this phrase of, well, that was great worship or whatever, that was like whatever, on anything, um, but it requires more than just singing songs. Worship requires more than just singing songs because singing is what we do with our voices. That is absolutely true, but worship is what we do with our hearts and it's what we do with our lives. And worship can absolutely manifest through singing and, and sitting in a gathering and Michael's leading worship. I mean, it's like that can 100% and very often is a form of worship. But another form of worship is loving your neighbor, loving your enemy. Another form of worship is taking care of your family. Another form of worship is taking care of the sick, of taking care of the homeless. These are, those are all forms of worship because what matters first is that heart. And so it could be that, that heart posture and that place of worship that you've come to in your heart. It could show up, like I said, in worship, or it could show up in all sorts of other ways. This is the type of worshiper that God is looking for. That he is standing, he is, he is, he is looking over his, his followers, over the people that hold his name, and he's looking for a worshiper that's willing to lay it all down just like that. And, it, and like I said, this is, this is not easy at all. And it's far, I mean, it's much easier for me to talk about because far, far too often I find myself in a place where I don't think my heart is in the proper spot for what this, this level of worship that I'm being called to. And I think that if I were to ask, I mean, I think a lot of you guys would say the same. You're like, man, I, that, is, that, is, that is facts. That is the way I want to live my life. But I don't always have my heart in that place. This is difficult, uh, a difficult place to get to. And, and so the point of these conversations as we begin to wrap up and get ready for groups is that, like, these things will never, I mean, learning to love God as part of your identity, learning to serve and serve God and serve others as part of your identity, and learning to worship God as part of your identity will never be easy. But as I, I talked about last week, like, each of these things kind of has a marker of how you can know, like, man, I'm beginning to grow in my heart posture for worship. And that's what this is all about. It's this process of sanctification, of realizing, man, this is the way that I, this is what the Bible says. This is how I'm supposed to worship. This is how I'm supposed to love. This is how I'm supposed to serve. Man, I've been missing the mark. I missed the mark today. I missed whatever it may be. I've spent my whole life missing the mark. But I know now what the standard is. I know now what the reality is. And it's not about works and doing all these things. It's just about, man, I'm going to submit my heart to him. I'm going to surrender to him, allow myself to be met and filled by the spirit that transforms and shapes and molds my heart and mold, molds my desires and moves me towards a place where worship in this way is something that naturally flows out of my life. And sometimes, and I've heard this used in the most gnarly of situations where, uh, where people have fallen out of love with their spouse, and they'll, but they'll say, man, I, sometimes uh, action has to come before affection or feeling. And they've done that, they've made that decision, and they, they've, they've reunited this relationship with their spouse because they made that decision. And so as we go through some of these next couple things, but as we talk about worship, we talk about serving, we talk about love, your action sometimes is going to go before your emotions. A lot of times it is. It's standing on the truth of what scripture is and being like, that is, that's just the reality of the heart that God is searching for. I'm, my heart's not there, but I want it to be. So I'm going to make decisions that put me in that place. I'm going to let my action precede my heart, and your heart's going to follow. Your affection's going to follow. The Holy Spirit's going to sanctify you, mold you, and shape you. Um, one scholar says it this way. The whole person, with all his senses, with both mind and body, needs to be involved in genuine worship. So really quickly, uh, we're, before we're going to close in worship after this, uh, and then we're going to go into groups after that. So that's the way that the rest of the night is going to go. I'm just going to go, and these are just briefly just some, some ideas and some things to think through. It's three ways to become, three ways to begin to become a worshiper. 
The first is simple, is ask for God's help. Because he cares for you. He cares about the way you worship him. He desires for you to worship him in this way. It's okay to be, as we just had this conversation, Lord, I am struggling to worship you like this. My heart is far from you. My heart is not in that place, but I want it to be. Would you, would you move, in me, move in me in a way that, that leads me and brings me to that place? Um, the second is get into a community that worships. And my, I, I, I think about my story and my testimony, some really key and crucial times in my life when I was surrounded by a group of guys that like really truly wanted to worship in this manner. Like that was all that they wanted to do. And what does that spurs you on? Like you're like, man, I want to live that way too. And you get into a community, and if you're like, I've got a group of guys around me, a group of gals around me that like maybe they know God, maybe they don't, whatever. Like, but they like be that catalyst for that group. Like you can be the person in your group that maybe is kind of lukewarm, is maybe not fully surrendered and all into this idea of worship. And you start doing that, and you're like, guys, let's let's do this. This is what we're called to do. And you turn that group into a community that worships. And the third one is that we touched on this already, but worship regardless of how you feel. And I, I said so often, um, well, I, I believe that so often our worship, and I know for me this is the truth that I'm constantly trying to kill and wrestle with, but so often worship um, is dependent upon my feelings or dependent upon our feelings. That, man, I'm going to devote myself to God by measure of how much I feel like it. Which is crazy. Like, when you think about it, I mean, it's crazy, but it's true, right? I mean, how often are we doing that? Um, and so as I said before, uh, that one of the components of worship is that we must worship in truth. And worshiping in truth is standing upon the truth and the promises and the reality of Scripture and allowing your actions to precede your feelings. Sometimes, sometimes you're just going to be like an emotional wreck. Your emotions drive you to the feet of Jesus. I've had that happen to me a million times. But oftentimes, the day in and day out, is that I know what the truth is, I know what the reality is, and so therefore I'm going to place myself by action in the spot to worship and allow my heart to come in tune with what Jesus wants to do. And your feelings will often follow your actions and mold you and begin to shape you into a worshiper. Um, so what we'll do, uh, worship team, you guys can come on up, um, is we are going to close this conversation here, and then there's groups all around the room, uh, try and, I, I've said this before, but like keep the groups as small as you can, like top end of like four or five, um, because it just, if you've been in any group discussion, it makes the, having the bigger groups just will usually not lead to better discussion. So we'll go into groups and uh, there'll be some discussion points where we could, I mean, the groups will only be as effective as you desire for them to be as you make them. Um, we could sit in groups and like just kind of do it, or you could be like, man, I want to wrestle with this tonight and I want to I want to dive into this tonight with you guys and um I also understand that in those groups, you're not going to, like, you know, necessarily just, like, share your deepest, darkest. I mean, you're welcome to do that. It's a safe place to do so. But, maybe, like, if you're like, man, I want to build a community that wants to worship with me, then get a few numbers of those people. You might already know those people and start to rally around each other um, and be a catalyst for worship. So I'm going to pray. Uh, we are going to, and then we're going to move on with the night. Lord, we just, we just, we just praise you for tonight. God, we want to worship you. We want to minister to you, Lord. Just take our hearts, take our bodies, take our minds, and we lay them down before you. God, we want to spend our lives on the altar before you. God, I pray for, I pray for anyone in this room that is needing a touch of your spirit to lead them into a place that they have so been desiring to go to. Would you make yourself known to them tonight, in Jesus' name? Holy Spirit, would you make yourself known among us right now? Would you reveal your son to us? Father, would you reveal your son to us? Let that drive us to deeper and deeper worship. Posture our hearts in a way that honors you, that is the, the heart that the Father is seeking for. Father, we want our hearts to be one that honors you and one that moves you towards us. Would you make that the heart posture of this group tonight? All across the room. All across the room, we would just begin to surrender our hearts, surrender our hearts. Jesus, I give you my emotion. I give you my feelings. I give you my misconceptions. I give you my false ideas of what worship is. I give you my comfort. Lord, we surrender comfort right now. I break off all comfort in Jesus' name. Would we worship undignified? Would we worship with no limitations? No shame, no fear would hold us back from moving to a place of worship tonight. 
love you. We love what you've done in our lives. I just pray anyone that has never met you, that tonight they would have conversations that lead them to know you. God, we pray salvation in this room. We love you. We praise you. We ask that you just help us to lay it all down tonight. In Jesus' name.
Yes, Jesus, we offer it all to you. Uh, just would we remain in this place, would this heart posture be something that just permeates our lives. Um, again, take hold of our hearts. Do with us what you, what you desire. And so uh, we love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Um, okay, we don't have a ton of time, but I skipped groups last week, so we got to do groups a little bit this time. We just keep... Uh, just doing whatever we want. So uh, anyway, we're going to go into groups right now. So if you just just grab a group, uh, you don't need to be at a table. There's not enough tables. So just do whatever you want with the chairs, circle up. There's going to be some questions that you can kind of go through. Get to know the people in your group first. Um, I know that, that, you know, that beginning part, you're super awkward and you're like, that guy kind of smells weird. Um, that's okay. So just make some new friends, get into some groups uh, for the next little while, and then we will uh, be heading to in and out in a little bit.